Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Training and Communication for Earthquake Risk Assessment Project and Applications for Urban Risk Assessment. <clears throat> My name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's Communications and Program Manager. And before we get started with the webinar today, I just want to take a brief moment to welcome you and introduce you to ERI if you're unfamiliar with us. ERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization working to bring together people from a wide range of disciplines and places around the world who are dedicated to better understanding earthquake risk and to advancing earthquake resilience. <clears throat> if you're interested in finding out more about our work, including our flagship program, Learning from Earthquakes, which leads post-earthquake reconnaissance and coordinates for the global reconnaissance community, you can find out more at eri.org uh, and join us there. Uh, today's webinar is organized by one of our great all-volunteer committees, our Younger Members Committee. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Pajakta Jadhav, a postdoc fellow at the University of British Columbia, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to all of you. Uh, today's webinar has been conducted by EERI Young Members Committee. For those who aren't familiar with YMC, we are a group of graduate students, early career professionals, and academics in earthquake engineering within EERI. YMC provides opportunities for young members to serve on other EERI committees and initiatives. It also develops technical and social activities to foster professional development, which includes webinars, workshops, and annual meeting events. To know more about us, you can please visit our website through the web link given over here, and you can even reach out to us at the email ID YMC at ERI.org. With this, I will now take a moment to welcome all our speakers for the session today. Today's webinar is on the topic, Trek Project, Training and Communication for Earthquake Risk Assessment and its application on urban risk assessment. This project has been done by GEM Foundation in collaboration with USGS. With this, I will now like to introduce and welcome our first speaker for the session today, Catalina Jepes Estrada. She is a senior risk scientist at the GEM Foundation. She has participated since 2013 on a number of international projects related to earthquake risk assessment, seismic risk mitigation, and loss modeling. At GEM, she also contributes in the development and maintenance of the GEM's global exposure model global risk models, and the open quake engine. Before joining the GEM team, she worked as a structural engineer in a private sector of Latin America. Catalina completed her bachelor's in civil engineering and master's in structural engineering in the National University of Columbia. And she has also a master's degree in earthquake engineering and seismology at the University of Pavia Rose School. For today's webinar, she will be presenting on the topic Training and Communication for Earthquake Risk Assessment, TREC project. Over to you, Catalina. Thank you very much, Projecta. And hello, everyone. Uh, first, uh, we would like to thank, on behalf of the speakers, the ERI team for uh, inviting us to participate in the YMC webinars. So, Today, uh, this is the kickoff, let's say, of the presentation it will be more like overall uh, description of what we have done. Uh, and of course, we will focus on the urban and risk assessment component. Uh, the TREK project uh, was done during 2019 and 2022, and it was a project sponsored by the United, uh, by USAID. Uh, and the project was divided in two main components, one uh, for urban hazard and one for training and capacity building. Let me first briefly mention what, we, what was our goal on the urban hazard and risk assessment component. The idea was to support from the scientific knowledge, the municipal authorities through the evaluation of seismic risk. And here we have the key aspects that we work on, uh, starting uh, with the tools. Uh, at GEM, we have the Open Quick Engine, and it's a software developed uh, for seismic hazard and risk assessment. But we, we also created interdisciplinary groups, 
uh, with the different stakeholders and researchers in the in the cities we selected. Uh, we have the component of training and capacity, not only in the cities, but at a global scale. Um, and the idea was to produce key risk indicators that could help uh, to take better decisions for, uh, in the case of emergency response. And finally, the communication aspect. Once we have these results, how can we share them with a different range of, of audience? There were three urban centers that were selected for the TREK project. They are Quito in Ecuador, uh, Santiago de los Caballeros in the Dominican Republic, and Cali in Colombia. And the reason for selecting these, these three cities uh, is because, first of all, the, each city expressed their interest. Um, they are located in high seismic hazard areas uh, and have a significant risk within the countries. And therefore, they are in a high economic and cultural importance uh, and a lot of activities related to risk uh, assessment and risk reduction are ongoing, such as uh, seismic microsonation studies, national building codes are available for the three countries, and there are seismic risk assessment studies. So the idea was with these three cities, we could move forward the understanding of risk in the in the cities and build a collaboration network with different institutions. So here is uh, the logos of the partners that work closely with us. So we can we don't have the time to mention uh, all the names, but we are uh, very grateful for all their collaboration, their time. We had many many sessions with them. Uh, uh, they are the municipal offices of each city, but also the geological service of the countries, um, uh, universities, and a wide range of collaborators that join us in this support. And the following uh, presenters will go in more detail on the topics that we work on on the urban hazard and risk assessment such as uh, the development of seismic hazard models that are applicable at an urban scale, um, incorporating side effects when there are uh, microsonation studies, um, selection of consequence-driven scenarios, how do we select scenarios, what are the outputs of those scenarios that are interesting or useful uh, when, for in disaster response, uh, and from the probabilistic perspective, how can we do a risk assessment, how we develop a building inventory, how we use the software to do it, and what are the outcomes will be like the rest of the presentations, uh, sharing with you like brief descriptions of each activity. And this one, we will share more like the training and capacity building component. Uh, in the project, we divided this component into three main groups. One was the technical audience. Uh, the second one was university professors or academia in particular. And the third one was the, the general public. Starting for the technical audience, we provide training and the use of OpenQuake for performing uh, hazard and risk assessment. Uh, the OpenQuick software is free, and what we do is create training, uh, explaining through examples that are, have been developed within the, con the, the project, uh, how to use it. And initially at GEM, we were used to do training uh, on site training. So we were traveling different places. Uh, to provide this training, but as you can imagine, in 2000, beginning of 2020, the COVID pandemic started and we had to quickly move to the uh, online uh, version that now is very familiar to us. But at that time, we had to 
create all the platform and all the uh, material to provide such training. As a result, we, we have the website uh, training.opengrade.org that you are very much invited to, to visit. Um, this website is basically designed to get started with uh, seismic hazard and risk assessment using the OpenQuake engine. It has four modules uh, and it explains very uh, simple concepts uh, with hands-on uh, material, uh, how to use the OpenQuake. And for that, we also created online sessions so participants can go to the website and register. Uh, at this moment, we are doing another project sponsored by USAID, it's called FORCE, and we are also the, having online training in case you are interested, you can go there and register for future sessions or to the waiting list. Uh, the idea of the trainings uh, was that uh, we, we had 30 sessions, at that time maximum 30 participants, now we are trying to uh, open the space for more participants, given the, the good uh, level of participation and engagement that we have had. Um, and during the training, uh, we share some forms asking pre before and after the workshop, what is the understanding of basic concepts? So for example, if I'm modeling a scenario ground motion fields, am I familiar with ground motion models or with GMPs? And we do the before and after. Same if we are modeling risk. So for instance, basic concepts as fragility or vulnerability. During the project, we trained more than 400 people. We had around 1,100 1, registrations and participants came from 60 countries. So it was a, a very good uh, motivation for us to continue uh, providing these trainings and also opening to other like time zones. Uh, the training is available in English and Spanish. So we are covering a, a, a good uh, portion of uh, participants. So this is for the technical uh, training. Then if we move to the university professors, during TREK, um, five universities or professors from five universities in Latin America came together to conceptualize, create and implement a unified course for the study of seismic risk at the undergrad level. Um, in the website of the project that we live here, uh, you can find like the material that they develop, which are how to teach seismic hazard and risk assessment at the undergrad level. So basic concepts, uh, all the professors, sorry, three of the professors are already uh, providing such courses in their universities. And they are sharing out their experience, training, providing training and broadening the, the, the network of professors that are teaching in, in Latin America. And finally, uh, for the general public, uh, we design workshops and training videos. Uh, the idea of this workshop was to be designed for a different uh, range of uh, audience. Um, we design a documentation to help moderators of the workshop to provide it. Uh, so far, we have done the training for the risk emergency offices of two cities in Colombia. Uh, and we have provided a training to the general public, community leaders, for example, but also to the representatives of the offices that go and talk with the public. So the idea is to create an atmosphere that is relaxed, that explains basic concepts, but also to um, people engage in the emergency response, such as firefighters or the civil protection. And we provide uh, information specifically available for the city and open discussions about what are the outputs that risk assessment can tell us for earthquakes. Um, with that, I, I will conclude uh, my presentation. I will also invite you to visit the TREK project. There you can find like a lot of information. Uh, and thank you very much. Thanks, Catalina. Um, I would now like to invite our next speaker, Kendra Johnson. 
Kendra Johnson is a seismic hazard analyst at the CHAMP Foundation. She works on various tasks related to probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, PSHA, including building PSHA input models, contributing to tools and workflows used in PSHA, helping to maintain the global seismic hazard mosaic and supporting its user, and delivering PSHA and Open Quake Engine training sessions. Before joining the GEM Hazard team, she completed her bachelor's in geophysical engineering and PhD in geophysics from the Colorado School of Mines. For today's webinar, she will be presenting on the topic, National Seismic Hazard Model for Dominican Republic. Over to you, Kendra. Okay, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, as, um, as you know, I'll be presenting the PSHJ model for the Dominican Republic that we developed during the Trek project. Uh, so we developed the model ourselves because when we reviewed the pool of available models, we didn't find one that was quite suitable for uh, the needs within the Trek project. Um, so this was either because we didn't have sufficient coverage or the model wasn't openly available or possible to implement into OpenQuake, um, or because we knew of more recent information that wasn't included in this model. So we worked together with uh, some local agencies, the SGN and the UASD, in order to build a model that met our criteria. Uh, so I'll just give a really brief overview of the model today, um, trying to introduce the main components of the model and also of the model building process. And then I'll give a few examples of the types of hazard results that we computed. Um, and uh, end by showing you uh, where the model is available now and where you can go for more documentation to learn uh, more details about the model. So uh, first, just to get uh, geographically and tectonically oriented, the Dominican Republic is on the island of Hispaniola, which is just south of the uh, plate boundary between the North American and Caribbean plates. And uh, the relative plate motion here is oblique. So it's being taken up by a combination of subduction and subduction-like structures, as well as crestal faults, including some uh, fairly long straight slip uh, systems, which are um, all shown here. One of the main data sets that we used uh, to develop the model was a homogenized earthquake catalog um, showing observations uh, from the past. And we really relied on the UASD records that were provided to us in order to, um, to uh, truly homogenize this catalog. So uh, homogenization in this case means that we converted all of the earthquakes into the same unit of magnitude, and uh, that's the moment magnitude. And we uh, ensured that when we merged multiple data sets together, we didn't have any duplicate events that were recorded by multiple catalogs. Uh, so the, the bottom left figure here is showing the, um, the magnitude frequency distribution for the entire catalog. And on the right, we're showing uh, the next major step that we complete before starting to build the seismic source characterization, which is classification of seismicity to the major tectonic units. Um, so in this case, we used a number of different surfaces representing the, the crustal structure and the subduction zones in order to determine which earthquakes correspond to which tectonic region. The second major data set was the fault database. So we started with the CARE database. This was a, a fault database developed a few years ago in a, a past USAID project. And we added to this the SGN database, uh, which was compiled during uh, some internal projects that they completed in recent years. And uh, showing in the, the map at the bottom of the slide here in red, are the traces that came from the SGN database. So we can really see the value there of uh, the improved coverage, especially in the central part of Hispaniola. So this is just a very simplified depiction that's trying to show the entire seismic source characterization. Um, so we included three uh, tectonic regions. We have the active shallow crust uh, represented by crustal faults. Those are the ones shown in red and the uh, distributed seismicity, so these, um, these purple polygons. Um, and then we have subduction interface sources, both to the north and the south of the island. Um, and then finally, we have the subduction intraslab sources here in blue, um, which is the intraslab seismicity occurring in the downgoing North American plate. 
So for distributed off-fault seismicity, we uh, first created source zones within which we considered the tectonic characteristics to be fairly consistent. And so those are the polygons shown here in blue. And uh, for each of the zones, we derived the seismicity rates and then distributed these rates across the zones according to the locations of the, the earthquakes in our catalog. Uh, for faults, we used uh, an approach to model faults as a system uh, called sheriffs, in which uh, we allowed ruptures to occur on any um, uh, consecutive segments of faults or even spanning from uh, one fault to another fault. Uh, so the, the figure in the bottom left here um, is trying to show for one individual fault segment, what are the range of possible ruptures that can occur? Um, so we can see that some of the ruptures are um, extending along the fault itself. So this is the septentrional fault just north of Santiago, uh, whereas some of them, such as the one shown on the top here, is actually jumping onto another fault. So the advantages of this approach are that we're able to model ruptures that we know to be realistic, but that aren't possible to model with a fully segmented fault system. Um, it also allows us to vary the slip rate along the fault. And so we're more accurately capturing the, the fault properties um, in the fault system. Uh, the chart at the top here is showing the logic tree that we use to capture some of the epistemic uncertainties in the active shallow crustal component. So we varied the magnitude scaling relationship that was used to compute the moment budget for the fault system, as well as the ratio of seismicity that occurred on faults uh, versus off faults in the background. Um, we varied slip rates of two of the um, largest strike slip fault systems, and we used two different approaches to smoothing the seismicity um, according to the past earthquakes. So the, the figure on the bottom left here is showing how these different uncertainties actually manifest in the magnitude, magnitude frequency distribution for a single fault. Um, so we can see that there's a scaling up and down of the rates at lower magnitudes, as well as um, a distribution of, uh, of maximum magnitudes. And I'll just note that um, two of the subduction-like structures, the North Hispaniola Trench and Los Muertos Trough, uh, were also modeled in sheriffs uh, in order to take advantage of the, uh, the logic tree here, but we didn't allow these to rupture with active shallow crustal structures. So the additional subduction sources were the Puerto Rico Trench interface shown here in red, uh, we use the geometry from Slab 2.0 to have a, a 3D surface um, representing the interface. And we use two different magnitude frequency distributions, one that was a negative exponential derived from the seismicity, and one that is a more characteristic um, uh, style of MFD that was derived from the slip rate. Uh, for the subduction in slab sources, we use gridded ruptures that are constrained to the slab geometry. And we, uh, we use a magnitude frequency distribution defined um, for each slab volume, so the two volumes here in yellow. And then we used uh, two different assumptions to distribute the rates uh, throughout the slab, either concentrating most of the seismicity close to past observations or most of it uniformly throughout the slab. For the ground motion characterization, we used three different GMPEs for each tectonic region. Uh, we didn't manage to acquire um, enough strong motion data in order to build a database. So we relied a lot on the residual analysis completed during the CCARA project, uh, which used data for the Lesser Antilles. Uh, however, we knew of more recent GMPEs for subduction zones that had become available uh, since that project. And so we replaced some of the oldest uh, GMPEs in the CCARA logic tree. And we validated this using compar comparative scaling with our uh, very small data set. So just to give a couple of examples of results that we've computed with this model, um, starting out with hazard maps, the two maps on the right here are showing the peak ground acceleration computed on rock at 10% and 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. And what we noticed right away is that the, uh, the highest hazard is concentrated near faults. So we can see this along the septentrional fault north of Santiago, as well as on the east-west fault um, in the uh, southwest of Hispaniola near Haiti. Uh, or near Port-au-Prince. Um, and then away from these faults, we see that the hazard uh, reduces a lot, but it's still persistent throughout the entire, the, uh, entire coverage of the model. 
So now zooming into Santiago, since this was uh, one of our urban centers, um, part of the value of this model is that uh, in addition to viewing the mean, we're also able to view um, the individual realizations that can be computed from any combination of uh, the uncertainties in the, in the logic trees that we defined. And so um, here we can see the hazard curves uh, for Santiago, the red showing the mean and the gray showing each of those realizations. And the histograms on the right, I'm showing the probability distribution at the hazard levels computed at those two major return periods. And so we can see that, for example, in the 2% in 50 years, we're actually spanning a range of almost an order of magnitude. We also uh, computed disaggregation uh, to try and understand which rupture parameters, uh, including position, magnitude, and tectonic region type are having the most impact on the hazard. So we found that for Santiago, the ruptures contributing most are the ones in the active shallow crust, magnitudes larger than six and a half, and in particular, those that are very close to the site. So again, this is consistent with the September and all fault. So the, the input files for this model are in OpenQuake format, and they're available on the OpenQuake platform to, uh, to download. Um, so I'm just showing the, the link here, as well as the link to the OpenQuake engine. So in addition to the types of results that I previewed in the last slides, um, there are uh, a lot more things that you can do using this model um, in, in terms of uh, varying the locations you're looking at, varying the site parameters, and so on. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that for those of you who are interested in using the model. And um, I'll, I'll close by pointing you to the model documentation, which has a lot more detail than I was able to give you in this uh, short presentation. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll close there. Thank you so much, Kendra. Um, I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Robin G. She's a seismologist and has worked as a seismic hazard modeler since 2015. At the GEM Foundation, she co-authored the 2018 GEM Global Hazard Model and was involved in a variety of seismic hazard projects, including for USAID, the World Bank, and for the engineering and reinsurance sectors. Since 2022, Robin works at Partner Re as a seismic hazard and risk modeler. She received her master's degree in engineering seismology, awarded jointly by the University of Grenoble, Joseph Fourier, France, and the UME Graduate School from Italy. Her graduate research was focused on topographic site effects at strong motion seismic stations in France. For today's webinar, she will be presenting on the topic, incorporating site effects in urban hazard assessment. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, Projecta, for the nice um, introduction. And thanks a lot to EERI for the opportunity to present. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to be talking about incorporating site effects in urban hazard assessment. And this work was carried out by the GEM Foundation in collaboration with local experts uh, in Latin America. Urban hazard assessment is essentially seismic hazard performed at the city scale or the urban scale. And within the context of the Trek project, we also explicitly model the local uh, site response in, um, using the available geotechnical data. And this is important because um, soft soils can amplify or alter seismic waves, um, as we can see depicted on the figure on the right of the screen. And this has important implications for hazard and risk assessment. And we, when we work at the, the urban scale, we can account for these effects in more detail than we can compared to working at the national or regional scale. So the goals of this study are to work with the local experts and to develop site response models that cover all three of the Trek cities, and then to use the site, site response models to compute the hazard and risk for the three cities. So what, what were the main uh, ingredients of this analysis? Well, the first thing that's needed is a hazard model on rock. And an example of that was just shown by Kendra um, in the last presentation for the Dominican Republic. Uh, the second ingredient that's needed is a site amplification model for the cities. And this essentially means a set of amplification factors for various spectral periods and bedrock intensities. 
and an amplification factor is defined here as the spectral acceleration on soil divided by the spectral acceleration on rock. And finally, we need a way to combine both of these components. So different methods are available in the literature. Um, and for this um, project, we use the convolution approach, which is available in the OpenQuake engine. The workflow involved um, four main steps, which we'll go into uh, detail in each of them. So the first step was the collection um, of geotechnical data. So here you can see the available geotechnical data for the three cities, and the data comes um, mostly from previous microzonation studies. So the red triangles are showing us the locations where measurements were taken. These are the locations of the, the soil profiles. And in the colored polygons, you can see the different microzones. So these are locations where um, there's assumed to have a uniform site response. Here we can see an example of some of the collected data. These are the shear wave velocity profiles for each of the three cities. We can see that for Kali, um, this is the, the city with the deepest basin because there's the lowest VS values at depth. And Santiago is a shallower basin because the bedrock is reached at a shallower depth. And in addition to shear wave velocity, we also collected parameters like unit weight, plasticity index, and the water table, which were all needed for site response analysis. In the second step, we defined input motions on bedrock. So a requirement to perform site response analysis is to define the input motion at the base of the soil column. So to do this, for each city, we generated a 100,000 year stochastic catalog using the underlying hazard model. Then using the GMPEs that um, were part of the hazard model, including their aleatory uncertainty, we computed uh, response spectra on rock at each of the cities. And these represent um, the possible motions at the base of the soil column. The benefits of this method is that a wide range of scenarios and shaking intensities uh, were considered. And it's also a practical method because it only relies on having an underlying hazard model. Next, uh, we perform site response analysis. So site response analysis uh, was carried out using the software PySRA, and we used the 1D equivalent linear approach uh, and, and also the RVT approach. And so you can see the results of the site analysis here for a stiffer site on the left and a softer site on the right. So the results are shown in terms of amplification factors on the vertical axes as a function of um, shaking intensity on bedrock. Amplification factors greater than one uh, indicate soil amplification and below one indicate deamplification. So meaning lower motion compared to on bedrock. And we can see that for the stiffer site, most of the amplification factors are more moderate. While for the softer site, larger amplifications are reached um, up to values of three for lower shaking intensity levels, but also stronger um, deamplification and nonlinearity is also seen at larger shaking intensities. So median amplification factors, as well as the standard deviation of the amplification factors were computed for each zone. And you can see the median amplification um, factors in the, the black dots. This is what the spatial distribution of the amplification factors look like um, across all three cities. Here we're showing this, the amplification factors at a spectral acceleration 0.3 seconds when the bedrock shaking intensity is 0.1 G. So in this case, the majority of zones are amplifying because the amplification factors are greater than one. That implies larger motion on soil compared to bedrock. If we look at the picture when the bedrock shaking intensity is higher, 0.5 G, we see that um, we start to get some deamplification in some of the zones. This is shown by the, the blue colors. So these are amplification factors less than one. And these correspond to the softest zones, and this is due to soil nonlinearity. In a final step, we perform the hazard calculations in OpenQuake with the site amplification model. So 
So all of the results of the site response analysis um, are summarized in a CSV file for OpenQuake, just like the one you see here. There are the amplification factors and the standard deviation of the amplification factors for different spectral periods, bedrock shaking levels, and for the different zones. And using that amplification file, um, we can compute hazard on soil. And this is an example showing a hazard curve for one site in Kali, located within zone 4C. On the right, we can see hazard curves. Um, in the black is the hazard curve computed on rock. In orange is the hazard curve computed on soil using VS30. Uh, the two orange curves correspond to two, two different values of VS30. And in the red, is the hazard on soil computed using the amplification factors derived in this study. We can see that for low values of ground motion intensity, the hazard computed on soil using the amplification factors is similar to what we would get using VS30 and also higher than on rock. But at high values of ground motion intensity, so strong shaking, the hazard is lower compared to the hazard computed on soil using VS30 and also lower than the hazard computed on rock due to soil nonlinearity. And finally, we can see the impact on the risk results using the amplification factors. Here are the results um, in terms of loss curves shown for four different zones in Cali. So here we can see the losses computed using the amplification factors can vary considerably among the different zones compared to when VS30 is used. So in some cases, the hazard, or sorry, the risk of loss computed um, using the amplification factors is lower than on rock. That's the case for zone five. It can be similar to on rock, as we see in zone six, similar to when VS30 is used, as shown in zone four. And in zone two, we see that the, the losses are higher compared to when uh, VS30 is used. So just to conclude, um, with the local experts, we developed site response models for all three Trek cities and we performed urban hazard assessment. We demonstrated a workflow that can be easily applied to other air, urban areas. The only requirement is that geotechnical data is available. The workflow shown here is flexible. Um, the site response model can be developed using other methods, not just the one shown here, and it can be used in OpenQuake. Or similarly, the site response model that we developed here can be run in OpenQuake with other hazard and risk inputs. And finally, we found that using local site response models can either increase or decrease the hazard and risk results compared to when VS30 is used. And at longer return periods, the results are often lower and sometimes lower than the results on rock due to soil nonlinearity. So thank you. That's um, the end of my presentation. Thanks, Robin. So for our next segment, we have got speakers from USGS. First speaker is Dr. Kishore Jaiswal. He is a research civil engineer at U US Geological Survey in Golden, Colorado. At USGS, he leads the development of prompt assessment of global earthquakes for response systems, earthquake casualty, and economic loss estimation models. As a lead of engineering and risk project at Geological Hazards Science Center, Dr. Cheswar oversees the development of earthquake risk related projects, products for buildings and critical infrastructure. Dr. Cheswar is the principal investigator of 2017 and 2023 FEMA P36 366 studies that produced annualized earthquake loss estimates for the United States. We have another speaker, Dr. Robert Chase. Dr. Chase is a project engineer at Lettuce Consultants International in Boulder, Colorado. During his time at the USGS, Dr. Chase led the development of training and communication for the earthquake risk assessment, that is TREK scenarios, and developed 2023 NSHM scenarios for Hawaii, Salt Lake City, Alaska, and Virginia regions. He developed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from University of New Hampshire, and his master's and PhD in civil engineering um, from University of Colorado Boulder. For today's webinar, he will be presenting on the topic, earthquake hazard and consequence driven scenarios. So over to you, Kishore and Robert. 
thank you so very much for this kind introduction project and thank you eri for including us in this uh, fantastic webinar series i appreciate uh, on behalf of uscs uh, this opportunity and uh, today we are going to talk about the earthquake scenario work that uh, uscs contributed to this tech effort uh, we were part of the tech team uh, from the get go uh, thanks to the uh, kind support and funding from bsa as a part of usaid project Uh, uh we had a very specific role in this uh, track effort which is to develop a set of new scenarios for each of the three cities that can uh, and others have talked about uh, and the hope was to to create uh, to use these scenarios as a way as a tool to create awareness about the underlying seismic hazard and risk that each of these three cities faces uh the other also important application of this scenario was to for our in house application we can use these scenarios to develop uh, usps real time products and these products can essentially be uh, shared with the stakeholders in each of the three cities to make them aware about this product as well as to inform and educate them in terms of how these products can essentially be used uh, for practical response purposes um uh, if you go back to the uh, yeah so go to the next slide so Our uh, scenarios have been generated in the past for a variety of different applications. This slide just show a, a summary of how our scenarios have been used in the past. Uh, and at USGS, we we maintain a healthy catalog of our uh, scenarios that USGS has produced, thanks to the effort led by Dr. David Dowald and others within USGS uh, to to basically create a catalog of our scenarios that uh, USGS has produced. for different applications uh, the, the other pictures basically show how each of these different scenarios have contributed to the earthquake risk awareness and planning purposes both domestic as well as international uh, applications um, so starting with uh, for example the the m9 cascadia scenario that scenario basically helps to generate a uh, ground motion uh, which are uh, very difficult to basically Uh, produce from just a conventional uh, ground motion model uh, to think about a big uh, cascadia earthquake, how that earthquake will produce ground motions and how that those ground motions can be influencing the building stock inventory uh, in the in the region. Uh, similarly, earthquake uh, scenarios have also been used for different planning purposes. Um, for example, here shows the Hayward scenario on your right, which basically look at a magnitude seven earthquake on Hayward Fault and trying to Or forecast the potential impacts that such an earthquake could cause uh, into the built environment, and uh, and these examples are essentially uh, to highlight how earthquake scenarios are uh, really a, a useful piece, a useful uh, product that people can make use of for planning purposes. Uh, next slide, please. So with the, with the same context, what USGS try to do is really make use of the Underlying information about earthquake hazards that each of these three cities that are shown on this map, Santiago, Cali, and uh, Quito in Ecuador. Uh, to think about uh, the hazard associated with each of these three cities, uh, using the existing CSA hazard models as well as the new updates that uh, Kendra and others just showed, uh, and use those hazard uh, information to think about uh, creating a disaggregation of that hazard for a given site in each of these three cities. and produce a reasonable and representative earthquake scenarios that can be used for planning purposes uh each of these three cities have also experienced some sizable earthquakes thankfully not a direct hit but some sizable earthquakes in the past that are shown on this star like example uh, illustrity earthquake uh, however uh, there is no significant direct uh, uh, like uh, large earthquake that have occurred nearby the city so we really need to think about going beyond uh, what was available to existing set of scenarios that were done as well as look at the psa uh, results and look into existing map plots or uh, newly map plots to think about uh, uh, developing earthquake scenarios for uh, for application next slide please uh, so we were not the first one to actually look into scenario applications uh, in the context of this city Uh, I show a slide here, which, which really is fundamental 
and very important study that was done thanks to the efforts led by Geohazard International. Uh, they, they, they looked into the hazard associated with the city of Quito and developed some useful scenarios for planning purposes uh, in the past. And uh, really the challenge with scenario development is you didn't need to understand well, who's, the, who's your target audience, uh, what are the different use cases for, this, for which the scenarios are being developed. Uh, and uh, when, when developing such scenarios, we need to really think about working closely with the local experts. And we try to do that in, 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 for each of these three cities uh, for our applications. Uh, for, for Quito, for example, uh, Hugo Yepes was critical uh, his work in the past in assessing and mapping some of those uh, faults, as well as uh, under, uh, ha having a first-hand experience of developing a scenario was fundamental for this work. Uh, my, my final slide, is, I'm just trying to highlight the, the key challenges when we are trying to think about developing scenarios. Uh, in the past, people have, uh, people have used scenarios as a way, uh, as, a, as an effective tool to communicate hazards. But the way the hazards, uh, the earthquake scenarios were chosen was not consistent. Uh, sometimes uh, 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 they were not truly representative of the true hazard that the city faces. Uh, there are some additional challenges associated with scenario development. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, for the case of Quito and, and Santiago, uh, as well as uh, uh, the other city, we, we, had, uh, we had really great partners to work with uh, uh, for generating these scenarios. And to, to sum up, basically, I would, I would emphasize that uh, no scenario is the wrong scenario. Uh, we, we really need to think about the underlying hazard and how these scenarios can be used uh, for, for uh, the application that it is designed for. And uh, Rob, in the next few, set of, few slides, we'll try to highlight for each of these specificities how we pick those scenarios and how we develop different real-time products uh, that were uh, essentially shared with our local partners. With that, I would hand pass on to my colleague, Robert. Thank you, Kishore. Um, um, hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and I helped um, develop some of the scenarios for the Trek project for each of the three cities. And I'll go over through some of those scenarios and the overview for each city, as well as some of the products that were created as a part of that um, prior to Alejandro's presentation following mine. Um, so to begin, um, for Quito, Ecuador, um, there were 10 total earthquake scenarios that we developed. Um, two were based on um, historical earthquakes, while eight were based on potential seismogenic sources surrounding the city. Um, and as Kishore mentioned, we really communicated heavily with local stakeholders on the ground. And in this case, Dr. Hugo Yeses was a huge champion um, of, for us in Quito and helped really convey what was needed and what they wanted for the city. Um, and that's kind of where you can see the eight scenarios that were developed um, nearby were mainly on the Quito Fault, the El Cinto Fault, um, and the Nono Fault region, as well as looking at the historical 2016 we've seen Ecuador earthquake and the 1906 Nazca earthquake. An additional um, similar subduction scenario that was magnitude 8.8 .8, was also developed um, on the Nazca subduction zone for this region. Um, and really what was apparent when looking at this was the, a lot of the earthquakes that were nearby to Quito on the Quito Fault and the El Cinto Fault and Nono Fault um, really can be a larger concern to the city when looking at metrics like risk and loss when compared to like larger, more distant um, Nazca subduction zone events. And that was also apparent um, when looking at the next city of Cali as well. Um, and that was even more highlighted because when we first began with Cali, when talking with stakeholders on the ground, really Cali was concerned with big subduction earthquakes, but similarly large uh, or more moderate closer crustal events were also of large concern. And that was on faults like the Daigua Kalima fault, the Kukuana fault, um, and the Salente de Buga fault. And so um, as you can see also with this map of showing, we also had a range of historical based um, in this case, eight historical based earthquakes, and then five um, scenarios based on potential seismogenic ruptures. Um, and then moving on to Santiago, um, as Kendra highlighted, this was a pretty complex region with a very large fault, the Septentrino fault, going pretty much directly through Santiago. So that's where 
we focused a lot of our energy on with scenario development. We also developed um, a scenario on the Northern Hispaniola thrust. Um, and so those are really where we focus to be close by to the cities. Um, there is also um, sources that were in the south of the island, but we're not quite as large of a problem when looking at the risk um, and potential losses in Santiago. And so that was really apparent when looking at such a big strike clip fault moving through the city on the Septentrino fault, which can produce um, magnitude seven and a half earthquakes and greater. And so next I wanna show some of the impact products that were developed as a part of these scenarios. I'll also mention that following um, each city had risk profiles developed in each scenario, which Alejandro I'm sure will talk about in more detail following what I'm showing here. Um, so for an example, um, a magnitude 7.0 scenario on the Quito fault, this resulted in an MMI of eight within the city of Quito. Um, and you can see the spatial distribution of fatalities and losses throughout the city with the historic downtown area really um, in the terms of losses having being highlighted as well as areas in the north of the city as well. Um, USGS pager estimates that the fatalities will likely between 10,000 and 100,000 and economic losses could be between one and $10 million. Um, when looking at the USGS ground failure product, um, there are really high probabilities of landslides resulting from this scenario within downtown Quito and also a chance, chance of liquefaction within the urban extent and then, as you can see, there's a higher chance of liquefaction um, south of the urban area of Quito as well. Finally, we also looked into um, examining other indicators like social vulnerability um, in conjunction with loss. So in this case, we looked at loss ratio. Um, and here on the plot on the left, we're showing um, a composite SVI score, which is a function of percent of children, percent of disabled population, percent of population not affiliated with social welfare programs, renters, and populations that cannot read or write um, to try to highlight areas where social vulnerability could be potentially highest in the city. Um, in the plot on the right, we're combining that and showing areas that from this scenario saw high losses in the addition to high social vulnerability. So that dark purple square is indicating regions in the city that were both um, had high loss ratios in addition to a high social vulnerability and could be um, highlight neighborhoods that have, um, that were, you know, suffered more greatly from this earthquake in comparison to the others with these metrics. Um, it can be helpful for emergency management, emergency managers and other city officials. Um, if you're interested in some of this work, we do have a publication coming out in SRL that is um, in the final stage of the publication. So look for that and please reach out if you have any questions regarding to that. And with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you. And these are our emails and can pass it on to Alejandro to talk to you more about some of the risk and loss of problems. Thanks, Kishore and Robert. Um, so I would now like to invite our next speaker, Alejandro Calderon. Dr. Alejandro Calderon is a structural engineer who worked for several years in the private sector in design and construction of civil and industrial structures. During his master's and PhD studies in the University of Pavia, he developed high resolution exposure models for the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors in Central America, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. Today, he is a seismic risk engineer for the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. The focus of his current research is developing applications to account for future changes and uncertainties in exposure and risk modeling using statistical analysis and artificial intelligence. For today's webinar, he will be presenting on urban risk modeling for Quito, Cali, and Santiago de los Caballeros. Over to you, Alejandro. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Pajatka. Can you confirm that you can see my screen and hear me well? Yes. Thank you. So uh, my presentation, uh, as Pajatka was saying, it's about urban risk modeling in these three cities and, and what those activities were related to. So, so far we've had um, Kendra, Robert, and Kishor talking to us about the size we have some modeling activities in these projects. So in summary, for each one of the, of the cities, 
we had a way to consider the occurrence of earthquakes, uh, whether through a PSHA model like Kendra was showing us, or through this um, selection of very relevant scenarios as Robert and Kishor were uh, telling us. Then we also had Robin um, speaking a little bit about the local size response models. So in a way, uh, we could improve our understanding of how the soils in each city would respond under intense ground shaking. So what I would like to do is to tell you about the other two components that you need to do uh, in order to, to be able to assess their quick risk. In other words, uh, the urban exposure component of this project and the vulnerability component of this project. So first, regarding the exposure, um, uh, the processing of developing an exposure model for a city is a little bit different than, one, than, than that for the country. So if you take the Dominican Republic, for example, and you develop a national exposure model for the Dominican Republic, you can make certain assumptions, uh, modeling assumptions, when, for example, you're looking at the, at the buildings at a municipal level. But if you take a city, and here I'm, I'm bringing Santiago into focus, uh, having one point or a grid of points or a group of points representing all the built environment in the city is simply uh, not enough, especially if we're going through all of these efforts of modeling the soil, uh, the dynamic soil conditions uh, for, for earthquake risk assessment, right? So what do we need to do in order to develop um, urban exposure models? Well, we need to look at uh, better sources of information, high, de high detailed sources of information. We also need to have uh, uh, take a look at uh, more diverse variables that can help us classify structures. We can also um, develop better algorithms to help us classify structures, in other words, parsing all this information and making it, uh, transforming all the information of the city into a highly detailed exposure model. And you can even um, uh, have better model validation techniques when it comes out to, to this kind of scale in the models. So let me start with, this, with, with the sources. So um, what do I mean by better sources? Basically, these cities are very big and uh, they maintain a series of databases that they rely on for the management of the city. So in this project, we work closely in collaboration with each municipality in the city to have um, this access to these um, databases and to be able to create high resolution exposure models. So what kind of databases are we talking about? For example, the cadastre database of the city, uh, the land plan use of the cities, uh, census and housing information, which is super important to have at a, at a subnational sub level, but in this case at the city level for each neighborhood, parish, etc. Uh, raster information for the city, looking at, that, at the city at different points in time in order to understand its evolution, what kind of vulnerability component uh, could there be in all structures and so on and so on. Then we took all these variables and what we did is we generated a single exposure database for each one of these cities that combines all of these different sources. So in these aligned databases that have all these different information, if you take a look at a single asset in this database, and in this case, I'm extracting a real polygon from, from the database in Quito, we, from each one of those databases, we can extract several variables that describe this asset. Um, and then we want to use, what we did is we use these variables in order to determine specific attributes that help us make an exposure model. For example, for the replacement cost, um, we would look at the economic value of this building. We will look at its area. Uh, we will look, uh, for example, to understand its occupancy, what is the main use of this building. And if we want to understand the vulnerability of this building, then the roof material, wall material, foundation time, number of stories, et cetera. So again, using this real uh, uh, example, if you take a look at the actual value of those variables for this polygon, you can see that there is, this is a, a building that has a million uh, dollar uh, uh, construction value. It's a, a series of residences. It's a concrete slab, masonry, five stories, and then, through a better uh, classification scheme, what I mean uh, is the mapping scheme, how we take all of these variables and, um, and make a classification of, uh, of, what, this, of what, this, what could be the vulnerability class of this structure using engineering criteria. So in this case, to arrive to a building taxonomy, this series of strings that uh, completely describe this, this uh, building type, uh, its costs, its occupancy class, et cetera. What do I mean by better validation methods? Well, because now you're talking not about a big country, but actually you're taking a look, a closer look at the city. 
Um, the cities usually have uh, building surveys, uh, on city surveys, this, uh, engineering inspections that you can take a look at and to make sure that the algorithms that you're using in order to develop an exposure model for every building in the city is actually making right predictions. So for example, in the case of Quito, I believe we had uh, over 2000 building surveys that we could take a look at uh, the results of our algorithm and see if it was doing right predictions or not. In the case of, of Cali, I think we had a 6,000 surveys or something like that. So we were able to make sure that our classification uh, tools were, were working correctly or as best as they could. And uh, hence we arrived to uh, a highly detailed high resolution exposure model that contains this universe of of buildings and the possible building classes that they can be associated to, the possible building vulnerability classes that they could be associated to. So look, take a look at the, at the example of Quito. We, we arrived to an exposure model that has 300 and plus building classes. That's great, but when you're talking about moving from urban exposure to vulnerability, it means that for each one of those vulnerability classes, uh, you need to have, a, for each one of those building classes, you need to have a vulnerability curve. Uh, to associate to. So in the case of Trek, what we made, what we used is the, we made use of the Global Vulnerability Catalog developed by the Gem Foundation. And this allowed us to estimate damage at different damage states for each uh, one of the building classes. But we also used uh, consequence models in accordance to what the decision makers and the risk as, uh, officers in each city were interested in, which is metrics of displaced people, uh, gravely injured fatalities, uh, which are beyond just estimating economic losses. So that's just to say um, how we how we did this. Uh, is 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 that enough? Uh, certainly not. As every country uh, and and in the reality of a city is as well that there is not enough uh, work yet in order to account for um, the local building constructions into actual uh, fragility functions that can be used to estimate losses for the particular universe of structures that you can find in Quito, in Santiago de los Caballeros, etc. So within the framework of, of, of the TREK project, we were also helping students and researchers develop, uh, that were developing these uh, type of local fragility functions to test them, to validate them, and providing expertise and our knowledge to see if, uh, if, if this research could be implemented within a, a, the, the CT models. So all of this, uh, the soil conditions, the urban risk modeling, the exposure, the vulnerability, the events, all of this is part of a series of deliverables that, that the project produced, and this is great. But today I would like to tell you a little bit about the emergency response and risk mitigation profiles that we developed for a CT using this kind of information. So for example, here I am, showing you what is the risk mitigation profile for the city of Quito. So what is the risk mitigation profile and what kind of information does it have? So the profile, if you take a look at the upper panel, the, it offers a main overview of the exposed uh, uh, assets in the city, how many buildings, how many people, schools, hospitals are exposed overall in the city. Then on the lower panel, we provide a map that gives you an idea of um, which are the most vulnerable uh, uh, communities in the city. Uh, because this is probably the risk, this, this resource take into account the uh, assimilated history of seismicity for the city. And remember, it also takes into account the local soil conditions, the high resolution exposure model, et cetera. So our, our main idea here was to show at a glance which uh, communities are at, at uh, higher risk in this history of seismicity. On the lower panels, we're also showing uh, important risk metrics, like for example, the risk analyzed per building class. So you could see in a simple panel, which of the building classes are contributing most to each risk metric. So for example, to, uh, to the analyzed fatalities, to the average annual uh, number of collapses. Uh, and we are also providing in another panel um, a, a quick view of the risk by uh, return periods. So this is a helpful information for the city officials in case of they want, if they want to explore risk transfer mechanisms uh, later on. Then we also have a kind of uh, emergency response profile. We call it emergency response profile. Uh, this is similar to the first one I was showing you, but there is one for each one of the events uh, and the scenarios chosen by Kishore and Robert, uh, identified together with the city officials. Basically, 
It provides the most important impact metrics for each one of these scenarios that is quite relevant for, for the risk uh, officials in the cities. And, and again, showing the main exposure in the cities, the most vulnerable uh, communities that are being uh, most affected by this impact. And below, we are showing uh, how we have uncertainties in this kind of analysis. And for each risk metric, we show um, um, a histogram of all the range of results that we're getting from each one of the simulations for each one of these events. So each one of these events has a specific rupture, a specific magnitude. It's an earthquake with a name and a, and a last name, let's say, with a full ID. Uh, and uh, we also started exploring how a high detail exposure model can be used for multi parallel purposes as well. So in the case of the city of Quito, together with the, with the risk officials of the city, we were also testing and developing a, a volcanic risk uh, profiles where for a series of hazard footprints for volcanoes and important eruptions in the city, we were exploring which communities would be more affected uh, um, for these different events. We had the privilege and the opportunity to, uh, once the COVID pan pandemic was gone uh, or at least passed in, in, in its more severe way, we were able to visit, uh, uh, um, for example, in this case, we were able to go to Cali and present the seismic risk profiles, the emergency response profiles, present them to, to the public general, the, to the public in general, but also to important city responders like the, the fire, fire uh, firefighters department and the, and the Red Cross. Um, I will just end my presentation saying that everything you've seen so far is open access. Uh, it was delivered to, the, to, to everyone, to the public in general in these cities through open repositories that uh, students, professors, and city risk management professors could, could access uh, all the time at a, 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 any information uh, and all the reports that we have developed, as well as the input uh, in models that we, that we developed. Um, thank you very much. That is actually the end of my presentation. I would just like to profit from having everyone's attention to kindly invite everyone to, to a GEM conference uh, that we're organizing for next week. The conference will take place uh, on the 13th and the 14th of June. And it's entitled, Are We Making a Difference? And if you're interested, I think it's a good opportunity to listen to great speakers talk about very relevant uh, topics like um, the lessons learned from the recent Turkey event, or to listen to about novel uh, products that Jim has been developing during during these last five years. So everyone is uh, is officially invited, and if you would like to register, I just recommend you you can go to this link and join us online uh, next week. So again, thank you very much on behalf of all speakers. Thank you very much to Prajatka and to and to Elizabeth. Thank you so much uh, to the to the listeners. Thank you so much, Alejandro. In fact, I would like to thank all these speakers for these interesting and insightful presentations. With this, I think it's time we start our Q&A session. Uh, although we have answered a few questions during the presentations itself, uh, I would read aloud a few other questions. Um, first question is for, I guess, Catalina. Uh, is this session piece of the second part developed for training educational and communication material to enhance the understanding of earthquake risk worldwide? I can expand uh, this question a bit. Uh, can you um, can you talk about the um, how track could be extended for the earthquake risk worldwide? Thank you, Projecta. So. Um... One can consider this a uh, session part of the communication because the idea is to share what we are doing uh, on the topic, uh, what are the outputs or what the, the different considerations that can be taken into account when doing seismic risk assessment. Uh, so it's in the broad group of communication, that is correct. Uh, for technical, as we mentioned, we are inviting you to, to visit the training.openquick.org. And for the extension of the question from Prajakta, um, extending it at world level is, is challenging because Trek focuses on sorry, Trek focus on urban centers. So the level of detail as Alejandro just showed is very intense and hard to achieve uh, a global scale at that level. However, at GEM, we are working 
towards providing better information and files and models at the global scale. So it's part of our mission as, as GEM Foundation to keep increasing like the understanding on a global scale. Okay, thanks, Catalina. Um, we have another question for Robin. Um, great project. And have you considered or checked any other material model other than the equivalent linear model? What material models are right now available in OpenQuake? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so in this project, we only considered equivalent linear analysis when we perform the site response analysis. Um, and actually the site response analysis needs to be performed outside of OpenQuake. So there's actually some flexibility. So any modeler or user could develop the site response model using whatever methods they choose. And then as long as the format of the results are compatible with the OpenQuake engine format, which was the CSV file that I showed in the presentation, that site response model um, can be then run in OpenQuake to compute hazard um, and risk. Um, but yeah, so what you saw ask, also asked what material models are available in OpenQuake. So they're not available. That all needs to be done outside of OpenQuake. Yep, thanks. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, I think now I have got a more specific question um, for Kendra. In the Dominican Republic subduction model, you assumed magnitude up to eight. Is that magnitude based on a maximum historical value or extrapolated from the available historic record? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, I actually didn't list the maximum magnitudes in the in the presentation, so I think this person must have read the report already. Um, but in fact, for the for the Puerto Rico uh, trench, what we used was a, a delta of zero point three. Um, uh, that we added to the maximum magnitude for the uh, um, observed uh, earthquakes that were classified to the Puerto Rico Trench. Um, and maybe worth noting that we, for the larger events, we review them. Um, we don't just rely on the automatic classification to make sure we're happy with where they were placed. Um, and then I can also add that for the uh, parts of the subduction that were modeled using Sheriff, the, the magnitude um, is computed using the magnitude scaling relationship. Um, uh, so there's a, a maximum that's allotted uh, and that's for each segment. So um, the, the maximum magnitude comes that way, but then we do check them against the largest observed earthquakes to make sure that we're capturing um, what, what has been observed. Um, okay, thank you, Kendra. Um, we have another question. Um, most nuclear power plants are designed based on PSHA. Which risk analysis would be better for designing the urban system? PSHA based or scenario deterministic based? Um, okay. Can I answer that? Maybe I yeah, can just go ahead quickly answer. answer that. Um, yeah. So I think both kinds of scenarios are very important when you're analyzing, uh, analyzing risk for a city. As I was showing you, uh, uh, through a PSHA or probabilistic way, you can understand uh, long-term, uh, identify which uh, communities are more vulnerable to earthquakes long-term overall in, the, in, in, a, in a simulated uh, period of seismicity, and then assign resources uh, to um, mitigate those risks. I think uh, events, on the other hand, are very useful to showing uh, the possible impact that a given magnitude earthquake can have in the city and then tests, tests the strength and the weaknesses of the response mechanisms of the cities to emergencies. So I think both uh, in the case of a city of, uh, of an urban center, I think both uh, are quite valuable to a decision maker. Uh, so I would say both are necessary. <laughs> Very well, thanks Alejandro. Uh, we have another question for uh, Kishore and Robert. Which approach is better, scenario earthquake or classical PSHA? And how do you define the average of loss of life since the scenario calculator gives different numbers for each ground motion field? Yeah, I think I tried to answer that in the chat window, but I'm probably saying quickly that um, 
there used to be a debate about which one is better, deterministic or probabilistic. And I think that debate has pretty much settled now. Uh, people use both deterministic and probabilistic still today, even, even though more people are leaning towards using a probabilistic hazard assessment because they can be thought of as a, a culmination of many, many different deterministic earthquakes. You know, it could be tens of thousands or millions of earthquakes basically done. If you do your PSC right, you don't need to do the deterministic. <laughs> the, the real challenge is, in order to get a PSA uh, model done right, you need to really be holistic about understanding of seismic sources and uh, the ground motion generated from such sources, as well as thinking about what is uh, basically what all your models can capture and what they cannot. And understanding and acknowledging that uncertainty through a proper framework. If you do a PSC right, you are already covering for most of deterministic hazard modeling. Uh, but but uh, since this question is coming, I would give you an example that uh, in the United States, US code ASP7, for example, it still makes use of uh, deterministic hazard as a possibility for specific locations. Uh, it does allow you to use, make use of that hazard uh, based calculations for design of new buildings. Uh, the second part of your question was mainly focusing on uh, how does that compare with scenario earthquakes? So the scenario earthquakes, like, like Alejandro just mentioned, scenarios have been used in the past predominantly to help general public because they are not very worth of uh, understanding this complex hazard model with uh, thousands of logic branches. They really can't understand that kind of a modeling to make use of the hazard that comes down in the pipe. Uh, so scenarios actually help them because they they really can make things uh, tangible and viable and easy to understand for people to to think about earthquake hazard and risk that they face in a given community. Uh, in regards to the like simulator, open case simulator calculator, it does make It seems like that connection has been interrupted. Maybe we could move to another question. Um, okay, sure. So another question is from mixed hazards point of view, I would say. Um, Gerald is interested in motivation related to earthquake engineering and lifeline community, um, but to begin a discussion of the consequences of a major earthquake during a red flag fire wind, such as Santa Ana or Diablo wind, as the many points of ignition are indeterminate, how should I graphically present the credible risk? Um, any thoughts by either Robert or Kishore, or I would ask panel any of the panelists to just volunteer and answer this question. Uh, could you repeat that question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so Gerald is interested in motivation related to the earthquake engineering and lifeline community. Um, to begin a discussion over here for the consequences of major earthquake uh, during a red flag fire wind, such as Santa Ana or Diablo wind, as the many points of ignition are indeterminate, how should he graphically present the credible risk uh, it's a bit unclear i guess but uh, um i per have perhaps i don't know i don't know if if i understand correctly the question but it could happen like for i don't know giving ideas like the when we present probabilistic risk for earthquakes we also don't know where the earthquakes are going to happen they can be in many points as you are indicated so something like uh, it comes just to my mind, it could be if you have the consequences uh, for fires happening in different places, you could report like where are the areas in which would be more likely to have it or average consequences, which are kind of the profiles 
that Alejandro presented at the end uh, that we can do when we don't know exactly when the earthquake is occurring. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Catalina. Uh, I hope the uh, question is answered. Um, oh, I think we, we have one last question. Uh, most GMPs provide the ground motions at frequency as low as 0.1 hertz. Would the ground motion response less than frequency of 0.1 hertz not necessary for risk analysis? Hmm, anyone want to volunteer and answer this question? I think this is a question maybe for Kendra or Robin. Um... I'm not sure since it's uh, it's asking what the effect on risk analysis is. Um, uh, in the case of PSHA, the GMPEs um, often also define the PGA, and then usually there's some interpolation in between them. And so um, in terms of how this is impacting the risk analysis, uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I would just say if in terms of risk, if it's a really low frequency, that's going to correspond to a really long period, um, like 0.1 hertz is 10 seconds. And so how that's going to correspond to a building and the fundamental frequency of a structure is probably going to be a lot, you know, longer motion, longer period motion, um, closer to the structure's fundamental frequency. So likely it's hopefully not going to contribute too much to uh, the response of the structure, but it's just, it's a, it's a very long period. Yeah. I think I could agree with you, Robert. Thanks, Robert and Kendra. Um, I think, thank, thank you. Thanks to all the speakers on behalf of YMC EERI uh, for these uh, interesting presentations again, for sharing um, this insightful work and for your valuable time. Uh, thank you so much. I think I would now hand over the control to Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much to all our speakers and the YMC for organizing this great webinar. I just wanted to ask those of you take a, who are participating to take a brief moment to please complete the post-webinar survey that should pop up when this Zoom ends and you'll also receive it by email tomorrow. You can learn more about ERI at our website you can also check the What We Offer section for news on upcoming webinars. We're working on planning one for next month that will look at impacts of the Kahraman Marash earthquake sequence in Turkey uh, on the Syrian side of the border. Um, so we don't have a date for that yet, but stay tuned. Uh, if you want to support ERI's reconnaissance work, uh, we're fundraising for the LFE endowment. There's a link there. And then finally, I just wanted to acknowledge the funding that makes webinars and other events like this possible which comes both from FEMA, from that LFE Endowment Fund, and from ERI members like many of yourselves. So thank you again for joining us for this event uh, and hope to see you next time. <laughs>